series on prayer, we've been looking at the premise or the basis of prayer. The emphasis, to my mind, is our view of God really dictates a lot about our prayer. And uh, this morning, I want to kind of merge into the practice of prayer. So I'd like to read Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. This is from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus concludes this story by saying, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It's said that every relationship is as good as its communication. I believe that. I found that to be true in the opportunities that I've had to counsel couples that are approaching marriage. A chunk of what we talk about is communication, constructive, healthy ways to talk to one another. Communication is uh, an indicator of the health or the illness of our relationship. I read this uh, article this past week by... John Powell. John Powell is a Jesuit priest. I'm familiar with John Powell because uh, I've used a book of his in discussing communication among couples called Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? I thought I would just read a few sentences from the opening having to do with communication because just as communication gives us a sense of the health of a relationship with a husband, a friend, a co-worker. So it is with God. Our communication with God, which we call prayer, is also uh, a matter of being open and uh, discussing what's going on inside of us. Here's how John Powell opens his book. Our communication refers to a process by which someone or something is made common. That is, it's shared. If you tell me a secret, then you and I possess the knowledge of your secret in common. And you have communicated it to me but you have much more to communicate to me if you wish to than merely one of your secrets. You can tell me who you are just as I can tell you who I am. In our society today, we have placed a great stress on being authentic. We've talked about placing masks 
over the face of our real selves and of playing roles that disguise our true and real selves. The implication is that somewhere inside you and inside me lurk our real lives, our real selves. Supposedly, this real self is a static and formed reality. There are moments when this real self of mine shines out of me, and there are other moments when I feel compelled to camouflage my real self. There is some, perhaps, justification for this manner of speaking, but I think that it can be more misleading than helpful. There is no fixed, true, and real person inside you or me, precisely because being a person necessarily implies becoming a person, being in process. If I am anything as a person, it is what I think, judge, feel, value, honor, esteem, love, hate, fear, desire, hope for, believe in, and am committed to. These are the things that define my person, and they are constantly in process, in the process of change. Unless my mind and heart are hopelessly barricaded, all these things that define me as a person are forever changing. The answer that he gives to the question on the face of his book, why am I afraid to tell you who I am, is that I'm afraid to tell you who I am because you may not like who I am. And that's all I have. In the article that I read by Powell, he claimed, he argued, and I thought established, it certainly rings true for me, that at the bottom of every religious experience, there's surrender to God. At the bottom of every religious experience, and I know we may not feel comfortable with the words religious experience, but it's his article, but I know what he's talking about when he says religious experience. You've probably had a religious experience with God. I have, which I'll talk about in a moment. But at the bottom of it, he says, is surrender to God. And at the price of surrender, we experience change. We, we are filled with peace, and we experience the very strength of God. I find that certainly true for me. I've shared with you how alone by myself after a long walk, and weeks of depression and feeling like I was completely broken, had really nothing to live for. I was re arguing with God, resisting God, but on that night, I gave in. I surrendered, and it changed everything. That's what it was, surrender. Romans 12.1 talks about it, Paul talks about it there as uh, metaphorically as your life being presented as a sacrifice. And then he's quick to add a living one. 
because that should be kind of an on, ongoing experience to touch God, so to speak, to experience God. It requires surrender. We fill our lives with ourselves, but to experience God, we've got to put God in front of ourselves, above ourselves, in place of ourselves. I think Paul resonated with that not only as he writes, for example, in Romans 12, 1, about presenting our our bodies as a living sacrifice, but in Colossians 2, 6, he says, as you received him. Well, that's how I received Christ. Up until that point of surrender, I was resisting, not receiving. I was arguing with God. I wanted another way to cure my ailments, my emotional ailments, without having to turn and surrender to God. But that's what I did. And I, I think I'm... I'm talking to a sympathetic crowd because you probably know what I'm talking about. But Paul said, as you received him, so live in him. In other words, continue living that way daily. Don't make it this rare occasion as you received him in that point of defeat and surrender where you didn't have the power to live your own life, so you turned your life over to God. And by the way, in Powell's article, he, he talks about um, Bill Wilson, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, that higher power. But that, that's, that's the reality. That was the only way that... Many alcoholics could break this power that had a hold of their lives, was to surrender, completely surrender. This this is the thing, that we have to keep surrendering. And on the theme of communication, uh, surrender really is that intimacy with God that opens rich communication, that that humility. See, surrender is fundamentally humbleness, humility before God, which is the proper position and posture that our lives should have with God. I'm familiar with the fact that that that's alien to me, And I believe it's alien to us all. And so Paul, when he talks about the flesh, which is symbolic, he's not talking about our skin necessarily, but he's talking about kind of the earthly life, our our kind of innate sinfulness, in which we're kind of rebelling against things. We want life our way, on our terms. That's what makes us happiest, and nothing else will quite do. That's a kind of our modus operandi, our natural operating system. And so Paul says it's only in the crucified Christ that we can put that flesh away and overcome that in our lives. And that's why surrender and humility can only be found in the love of Christ, the gospel in a a word that, that represents God's great love for us, knowing exactly in who we are, and he has given his life for us, this incredible demonstration of our worth to God, a worth that we don't even have in our own estimation. And it is in the 
impact of that truth, that reality upon our lives that we apprehend by faith that we find the power to overcome ourselves. And I mentioned that we have to keep dying to ourselves in that way. We have to keep surrendering. When we are, uh, when Shelley and I moved to San Francisco, that was actually the first formal pastorate that I'd ever had. So I was in my 30s. I don't remember the exact occasion, but it might have been in the middle of our time there. But I'm about two years older than Shelley. I'm probably 34, 35 at the time. I can picture where we are, uh, the time of day by the light in the room. And we were having an argument. And I was winning that argument. Uh, my powers of reason, you know, it was just winning that argument. But the, the, here was the thing. Inside of me, I knew that the argument was kind of a facade. I still wanted to win the argument because I was upset. But underneath it all, there was this need, this, this thing I really needed from Shelley. But I was masking that whole thing. I was making the argument about her failure, but really... I had never communicated this, this need, this want that I, that I had. And that's really what it was all about, that she had not perceived that. And, of course, she couldn't without my help if I didn't tell her. And so this argument's going on here, and God just impresses it upon me that I'm being fake and that I should tell her the truth. And so I did, and that's why I remember it. It was a real turning point in our marriage. And I don't take pride in the fact that I was being a jerk, but the fact of the matter is that I'm talking about all of us. We all do this. Sometimes we, we don't think about what's at the root of our emotion, but if we dig down, we can find that there are often deficiencies that we expect others to meet. And we don't do a very good job of talking in human terms that are non-threatening, that invite a person to come full closer about that need or what's going on inside of us. It's easier to find fault. But I think this is a great illustration of how we've got to continue to surrender in our lives. We have to be aware of our lives in such a way that God is present and he's at work because, you see, we're not a static self. We are what we think. We are what we hope. We are what we judge. We are what we criticize. All the things that he listed have to do with who we really are. But that's where the change takes place when God is real in our lives and the prayer can be on our knees, it can be at a set time, it can be in our closet, or it can be in the midst of an argument. If we're willing to listen, if we're experiencing and growing in a good communication with God, but it takes humility. It takes surrender. Here's the carrot. Here's the prize. Here's the, the beacon on a hill. It makes you more Christ-like. It makes you more humble. It makes you a better person. But sometimes you have to create... You have to eat crow. You got to eat humble pie. Uh, you got to do things that are right, uh, whether it feels easy or comfortable or not. Surrendering to God brings about humility in our lives. And when we're humble, a lot of other good things happen. We become more honest more real, more transparent. 
more gentle, more kind, more giving, more open. Because we don't have anything to hide. We're constantly exposing our lives to the changing of the work of God in our lives. Honesty with God is essential to prayer. In prayer, humility honors God with honesty, not hypocrisy. Here, this is a parable that we read of, of two prayers, you could call it, but it's really the parable of two hearts, the heart of a Pharisee and the heart of a tax collector or tax gatherer. And these are the, at the opposite ends of the social spectrum uh, in Jewish society. Uh, no one is a finer person in the eyes of society than a Pharisee. Uh, he lives for God. And unlike a priest, he does a lot of things out of piety, out of devotion to God. We saw last week when we were in Matthew chapter 6, kind of the three main areas of piety, giving, prayer, and uh, fasting. And we see actually tithing and fasting and prayer right here in the depiction of the Pharisee. Uh, he's praying, but he's talking about fasting and he's talking about tithing in his prayer. At the other end of the spectrum was another Jewish person, the tax gatherer or collector. They worked for the Roman government or as could be the king who was a pawn, so to speak, or a figurehead of the Roman government. But the taxes, there was a portion that went to the state and the rest went to Rome. And they were hated because often there was, there was all kinds of, of extortion involved. And you would bleed people for more than what was actually being taxed. So you were not only ruthless, but you were not a very good Jew. So we have these two extremes depicted here. And the Pharisee, we see his prideful heart in verses 10, 11, and 12. He gets three verses, three verses of this very short parable. His picture, the picture of this Pharisee uh, matches the picture of the hypocrites in Matthew 6 when Jesus was teaching, don't be like the hypocrites. Here, he starts off with a thanksgiving prayer. God, I am so thankful. But then he goes on to talk nothing about God, but only about himself. The Pharisee depicts God as if God is an elitist. Not our father, father of you and of me, but an elitist. The God who is the God of only the cream of the crop, the supreme. And Pharisees were superior to so many other people in their acts of piety but what we are to understand here is this has created a very prideful heart in which even though he is outwardly praying to God, in these two verses, he prays five times in the first person singular. I, 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 I. So in the end, the mention of God is just a mere formality. It's not a reality in his life. And God has to be more than a formality in our lives. Prayer isn't necessarily going to fix that. What makes God a reality in our lives is in the everyday mundane things that fill our lives, we find ways to surrender to God and do it his way and to follow his will. The Pharisee 
had a very, very prideful heart. And the thing that Jesus really is disgusted with and illustrating in this parable is that, as he says in the very first verse or the opening to the parable, verse 9, uh, he is addressing those people who are completely secure in their sense of acceptability to God. God, they're, they're right in God's eyes. They're righteous. And therefore, he says, they belittle, they look down on, they despise. They find people that are beneath them despicable. This should not characterize us in Christ. We, I guess, do get to that point where we think people lie beyond the pale, uh, that there are people who are lost and will never be found. They could never be transformed or touched or changed by the love of God. They could never know an experience of surrender to God. How many times do we dismiss people, people of a different political stance, or people who are of a different appearance or color of skin, there are things that are threatening in our world. There are things that are unnerving. I'd love to live in the 50s forever. That was a very happy childhood for me. But that's not the world we live in. That's not the world Jesus walked in. That's not the world that Jesus died for on the cross. It wasn't for an elite group, those who could rise to a certain level of accomplishment. It's for everyone. Otherwise, we have to stop and we can't complete the parable. You see, because otherwise there's no room for the heart of the tax collector at the other end of the spectrum. And in a sense, the reality is there's no room for any of us because no matter what we look like on the outside, our appearance to others, our ability to adorn our lives, maybe because we have a, an excellent job that pays well and we can drive a nice car and wear trendy clothes and do all the right stuff and hang out with all the right people, our hearts inside are just as black and needy as the next person's. Otherwise, we're not only unable to finish this parable, there's no gospel. And then we're really lost. But there is a finish to the gospel, to the parable. It's the heart of the tax collector. He himself sees himself as the Pharisee sees him. But he believes that God is not defined by the heart of the Pharisee. And so it is. The tax collector, he stands at a distance. He doesn't even dare to raise his eyes to heaven. They would often pray with head lifted, eyes to heaven. But he doesn't dare. We don't hear from him any self-congratulations, no summary of his good works. His prayer is just a humble plea for forgiveness and mercy. He has nothing to pray before God. He beats his breast, which throughout Scripture is a reference to the heart, which is the source of our sin. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? 
an attitude of surrender. Have mercy on me. This isn't something we do once. Do you know that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, I am the first among sinners. Not I was, he says, I am. That's an amazing thing. To read all of his letters, to think of all the people that he's given his life to, the churches that he's planted, the prayers he's prayed, this, the things that he has suffered for the name of Jesus Christ. And yet when he writes to Timothy toward the end of his life and his ministry with no more missions ahead of him, he says, I'm the chief, I'm the first. Why does he say that? Surrender. Surrender. And that's the beginning of humility that leads to the practice of prayer and good communication with God. This is just an illustration to prayer from a parable of Jesus. But Jesus actually enacted a form of communication such as we've been talking about, one that involves surrender and humility. It is the Lord's Supper. We do it in remembrance of him. The bread represents Jesus' sacrifice, his body, his life for ours. And the cup, his blood shed, the new covenant in my blood, Jesus says. You see, surrender isn't the end. It's the beginning. And the new covenant in his blood points us to this new relationship that we have in Jesus Christ with God a new life, a vibrant, dynamic life of change for the better to the glory of Christ. 